Gun ownership has been intertwined with the identity of America ever since the establishment of the 13 colonies. The Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, a 27-word, four-clause, oddly-worded sentence, says, A well-regulated militia, comma, be necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, comma, shall not be infringed. It has guaranteed Americans the right to keep and bear arms throughout time. However, this simple phrase has led to decades of debate around gun control legislation and limitations on gun ownership, arguments that have gone all the way to the Supreme Court. Throughout history, only a handful, eight to be exact, of Supreme Court cases have been ruled in regards to the Second Amendment specifically. In this video, we'll take a look at three particular cases and how the controversies and debates surrounding this amendment have changed throughout time. So one of the big questions today surrounding this amendment is does the first clause limit gun use to the militia, or is it implying it's the individual right to bear arms as seen in the second part? Well, to understand why the Second Amendment has provoked so much debate and its initial intent, we have to first go back to the earliest days of the United States. At the time the Founding Fathers were drafting the Constitution, there were two major political groups, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. The Federalists believed in a strong central government. The Anti-Federalists, fearing monarchy and tyranny, favored strong state governments. This issue also spread to the country's young military. Federalists argued that a strong standing army was necessary to defend against foreign attacks and domestic threats while anti-federalists believed those attacks could be pre prevented by state militias, who could be called upon in a moment's time to defend against a federal annexation. However, the onset of war doesn't always grant the opportunity to raise and train an army, and as the Revolutionary War showed, militia forces couldn't always be relied on for national defense. Therefore, the Constitutional Convention decided the federal government should have almost unrestricted power to establish peacetime standing armies and to regulate the militia, including granting the right to bear arms. Early in the founding years, this massive shift of power from the states to the federal government generated one of the chief objections to the proposed constitution. However, in the end, as seen in the Bill of Rights, with widespread agreement that the federal government should not have the power to infringe on the right of the people to keep and bear arms any more than it should have the power to abridge one's freedom of speech, the amendment was passed. An interesting anecdote to note is that the Bill of Rights was purposely written in a vague, very open-ended, non-controversial way as to get every state's ratification. As Richard Henry Lee, one of the two anti-federalist senators in the first Congress, once said regarding the Constitution, the English language has been carefully culled for words feeble in nature or doubtful in meaning. This is very important to understand, especially as it relates to the current day constitutional interpretation styles, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. During this early era of our nation, the focus of this amendment honed in on the first clause, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. However, as we will soon see, these interpretations will drastically change as time itself moves on. As we arrive into the late 1800s, the U.S. gets its first large-scale Second Amendment-related SCOTUS case, United States versus Khrushchev. What's the problem? Well, a group of individuals partially responsible for the 1873 Louisiana Colfax Massacre, which was the single worst incident of racial violence during the Reconstruction era, and the mass killing of over a hundred black militia members in order to avert a state election, were convicted under the Enforcement Act of 1870 for depriving other citizens of their First and Second Amendment rights. So, what was the ruling? Well, the Supreme Court overturned every individual's convictions based on the argument that the Second Amendment only protected individual rights from the federal government, not, as related to this case, particular individuals infringing upon the rights of others. This ruling acknowledged that the Constitution doesn't give us the right to bear arms, it simply protects it from Congress. This left states free to ignore the protections of the Bill of Rights and potentially restrict the rights of entire populations. During this time, Second Amendment cases were interpreted from a more originalist point of view, primarily looking at federal versus state rights and who truly had power in terms of a limited political government. Albeit the conflicted courts and war-torn country our nation faced as we began to rebuild after the Civil War, this common interpretation stuck for the roughly next 140 years to come until it was finally overturned in 2010. Let's now fast forward to the mid-1900s, as a large pivot in the Supreme Court stance on the Second Amendment is underway. In 1939, the Supreme Court decided to take on a case known as United States v. Miller. Two men, Jack Miller and Frank Layton, were federally prosecuted for transporting a sawed-off shotgun across state lines without the proper registration and tax required under the National Firearms Act, NFA for short. 
The two men argued that the NFA, a law designed to curtail firearm transactions, clearly violated the Second Amendment. What was the main takeaway? Well, the Supreme Court ruled that the NFA, which placed special registration and taxing requirements on unique firearms, did in fact not violate the Second Amendment. SCOTUS reasoned that only weapons that have a reasonable relationship to the effectiveness of a well-regulated militia under the Second Amendment are free from government regulation. In this case in particular, SCOTUS looked more at how the individual right applied in this amendment, however still within the confines and terms of the militia part. Known today as a textualist interpretation, this approach interprets the Constitution based on the text's original meaning, but oftentimes ignores outside factors including what law drafters may have intended in the first place. These approaches, both during the Reconstruction and New Deal era, will soon change into the late 1900s and early 2000s. From the 1950s onwards to the 2000s, the nation begins to see a greater introduction of gun control laws by state and national legislature. In response, there's a great political shift and realignment by many previously neutral private organizations, including the NRA, National Rifle Association, becoming more of a gun rights advocacy group heavily rooted in today's politics and this growing attention and accelerating movement um, only adds to a need for a more current day interpretation of the second amendment and this is how we get to heller known officially as district of columbia v heller this scotus case has become one of the largest landmark rulings in the context of the second amendment and the bill of rights throughout u.s history the initial issue well Special Policeman Dick Heller and several other residents of the District of Columbia all wanted a gun for self-defense. At the time, D.C. had prohibited the carrying of any unregistered firearms, yet barred all handgun registration. D.C. also required all lawfully owned guns to be kept unloaded and disassembled or bound by a trigger lock, including in a person's own home, with very few exceptions. Heller felt this ban prevented someone from properly defending themselves at home and violated the Second Amendment. In a 5-4 Supreme Court vote, largely split along partisan lines, the court made several rulings upholding our constitutional right to keep and bear arms. In a dramatic shift relative to prior cases, the Supreme Court majority used a living constitutionalist approach, interpreting and adapting the text in the context of the then-current national circumstances. As Associate Justice Antonin Scalia wrote in the majority opinion, nowhere else in the Constitution does the people refer to anything other than an individual right. We find that they guarantee the individual right to possess and carry weapons in case of confrontation. As we've seen throughout this video, the discussion and debate surrounding the Second Amendment has always been there ever since the birth of our nation. However, until quite recently, only in the past 15 years, has this discussion been accelerated and picked up. As for the future, the biggest question open after Heller is whether the Second Amendment protects the right to carry guns in public. Sometime in the fall of 2022, SCOTUS will release its decision on the upcoming New York Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin, deciding the constitutionality of open and concealed carry of firearms. Will the interpretations change then? What about the next five years and onwards? Well, who truly knows, but for history to decide for itself. Thanks for watching, and enjoy your day.